We interrupt our programming for a special two on your side breaking news report. This is a live look outside of the Erie County Courthouse where the man who admitted to killing 10 people and injuring three others in a racially motivated mass shooting at Tops on Jefferson Avenue will be sentenced. Thank you for joining us for this special report. Over the next several hours, we will bring you live coverage from inside the courtroom where family members of the 10 victims will be able to address Peyton Gendron face to face for the very first time. Now today's sentencing in court comes nine months and one day since the mass shooting at Tops. It is a day that has forever changed 10 families lives and an entire community. And right now we want to take a moment to remember those 10 lives taken, the 10 people who were shot and killed on that tragic day nine months ago yesterday. Catherine Massey, Hayward Patterson, Celestine Cheney, Andre McNeil, Margus Morrison, Pearl Young, Geraldine Talley, Roberta Drury, Ruth Whitfield, and Aaron Salter Jr. Now the top shooter faces more than a dozen charges at the state level. He pleaded guilty to those charges last November, 15 charges. They included one count of domestic act of terrorism motivated by hate, 10 counts of first degree murder, three counts of attempted murder in the second degree, and one count of criminal possession of a weapon. Now, with the court set to begin in just a matter of minutes, we want to go live to Channel 2's Heather Lee, who's been outside the courthouse all morning for us. Heather, what can we expect during today's sentencing? Hi there, Pete and Melissa. Good morning. You know, this is not a normal court appearance. It's not a normal sentencing. There is an increased police presence all around the courthouse. I've seen members of the SWAT team circling the building near some of the entrances. Also a very heavy media presence, not only local media, but national outlets as well. This, of course, this story capturing national headlines last May. And now a lot of those outlets are here to follow this next chapter in this case. Uh, we're presumably minutes away. Way. This was scheduled to start at 930, but we've been in touch with Claudine Ewing, who is inside of the courtroom. She tells us that there is a long line to get into the courtroom. Also, they appear to be waiting on some families to show up. Once this gets started, it is expected to be a very lengthy court appearance. We've learned that between 17 and 19 people who have been affected by this shooting will be in court today to share their stories, share their testimony, and speak directly to the gunman, 19-year-old Peyton Gendron. Family members who lost a loved one and survivors will share that testimony again in court. And as we mentioned, it was nine months ago yesterday that those 10 people were murdered inside of that Jefferson Avenue tops. The shooter, Peyton Gendron, pleaded guilty to murder and hate related terrorism charges back in November. Again, these are the state charges that he is going to be sentenced on today. He faces consecutive life sentences because he could get 25 years to life in prison for each charge against him. At least one life sentence is guaranteed. That's because of the domestic terrorism charge that he previously pled guilty to. I think that the, more people are going to be allowed to speak than normally, and it's going to be a long, very, very difficult uh, sentence. That right there was local attorney Frank Latempio. He also tells us that unlike some other criminal cases that we may have followed previously, because this one is so high profile, because there are so many families that have been affected by this shooting, that unlike typical cases where they might limit the number or limit the time that people are allowed to speak, he anticipates that those families will be able to speak for their full time. And again, we're expecting 17 to 19 people to speak today. Of course, that number could change throughout the morning, but that is, oh, we have to wait and see just how many people show up and how many people want to take that opportunity to address the gunman. This again are these are the state charges. This is the state criminal case against Peyton Gendron. There is also a federal case against him and we have yet to hear from federal prosecutors. They could be considering the death penalty for those federal charges. We should know more about that because after today Gendron is due in federal court tomorrow morning. Pete Melissa back over to you. All right, thank you very much. Heather Lee reporting live. We'll check back in a little bit. But like Heather just mentioned, we expect today's hearing to be lengthy and emotional for the family members. But others say they're not going to give the gunman even a minute of their time. Mark Talley lost his mother, 62-year-old Geraldine Talley, in the shooting at Tops on Jefferson. And he says he's not going to be attending today's sentencing. I can care less about uh, the constant media attention and airtime given to him. Uh, I can care less about the apology. It would be a privilege for him to 
hear me speak. So I refuse to give him that honor. Uh, he's beneath the lowest of the low, so therefore I don't, I don't need to be in his same presence. And Tally called the gunman a symptom of the much larger issue of racism, which he says should be getting the attention. And we're hearing this morning from two of the attorneys who represent the families of the 10 victims. Attorney Terry Connors released this statement saying, quote, the emotions of the families that we speak for run the entire gamut. There are those who are anxious to see the maximum penalty imposed on the shooter, but there are also family members who regard the shooter as irrelevant and pay him no deference as they strive to achieve something positive from this horrific experience, end quote. And then also this morning, a statement from local defense attorney John Elmore, who also represents families who lost loved ones in the top mass shooting. His statement says, quote, the families who I represent are relieved that Peyton Gendron will spend the rest of his life in jail and society is protected from him. And we also heard from uh, Buffalo Mayor Byron Brown sharing his thoughts ahead of today's sentencing. He released a statement saying in part, quote, these families lost so much. Our hearts continue to be with them. This day is not a day of celebration, but another day that calls out for justice and strengthens our resolve to continue our mission to end the gun violence that is plaguing Buffalo and cities across the country, end quote. And as residents anxiously await uh, today's sentencing and how it will turn out, many folks who live in East Buffalo are still traumatized. We spoke with residents and business owners about how the shooting has affected so many people. One person we spoke with says he's still too scared to walk into Tops. I just don't feel comfortable going in there. Not that I think that's something that happened, but I just mentally, I just can't go in there just yet. If you're not from the neighborhood, why are you hanging around the neighborhood? You can't be here for some good. The residents are still wanting, wanting for change to happen in the neighborhood, and they're looking towards city leaders to bring that change. And as we mentioned, the top shooter has already pleaded guilty to those state charges, and he is expected to be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole today. We're waiting for that to happen. Court was supposed to begin at 930. We have a team inside the courtroom right now, and as soon as that begins, we will start streaming that sentencing live for you. But his court case doesn't end today. Legal analyst and local attorney Paul Cambria joins us now with some insight on what we can expect today. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. And Paul, no surprises. We know what he's going to be sentenced to today, right? Can you explain how that process worked out when he pleaded guilty and what we know about the sentencing that's happening today? Right, correct. The domestic terrorism charge carries a mandatory sentence of life uh, without parole. So there is no discretion whatsoever uh, on the part of the judge. She must impose that sentence. Okay, and that's Judge Sheila Egan who's imposing that sentence today. A lot of people might not understand, though, the difference between what's happening today and then the federal trial, which is completely different, and still that decision yet to be made about whether he will face the death penalty. Can you explain the difference between the two and what we're looking at going forward? Right. From the federal standpoint, um, they will be there tomorrow. They'll appear tomorrow. The attorney general has still not made a decision as to whether or not they're going to seek the death penalty on the federal side. New York does not have a death penalty. It was found unconstitutional many years ago. But the federal side does have a death penalty. And there is a long process that involves a committee and ultimately the attorney general himself who will personally decide whether or not they will seek the death penalty on the federal side. And we were just talking a little off camera about that could lead to some uh, some some interesting debate because the the president himself has placed a moratorium on death penalty cases, correct? Yeah, that's true. Uh, president Biden has done that recently. However, the attorney general approved a death penalty uh, charge in another case. So they seem to be at odds. I mean, the president imposes a moratorium. On the other hand, the attorney general approves a charge carrying the death penalty. So there's a little bit of confusion there. The other thing is he's going to be in state custody today is once he's sentenced, he's now in the custody system of the state and they have to turn him over to the feds. And one of the interesting issues may be whether or not if he's charged with a death penalty charge, he's convicted and they impose the death penalty, will the state just give him up 
to the feds to be executed? Or will there be some kind of political play there because we have no death penalty in the state of New York, but the federal government does? And there's no precedent set yet in this state for something like that, right? That hasn't happened before? No, I've never seen that. You see it with different countries. For example, we had a, a shooter of an uh, abortion doctor many years ago that was in France, and before France would extradite him to the U.S., they had a promise from the U.S. that they wouldn't seek the death penalty. So that's to, uh, some discussion about the federal charges and sentencing, but let's talk again about today. What can we expect in court today? We know we're expecting to hear between 17 and 19 witness statements. They might be read because they're actual statements or the families might actually speak to Peyton Gendron, but can we also expect to hear from Gendron himself today, Paul? Well, I think so. I think we've seen sort of a, a strategy on the part of the defense to say you really shouldn't, and they're, they're gearing it toward the federal side because what they're doing is saying he's admitted responsibility, he's going to be contrite, today he'll probably apologize, and they're gonna to try to use all of that to mitigate and to convince the attorney general not to impose the death penalty or seek the death penalty. So I think we're gonna see that today. But procedurally, the prosecution speaks, They'll hear from all the people who are victims or family of victims. The defense lawyers speak, and then the defendant himself has the opportunity to speak. And we expect apologies and so on, again, geared toward the federal side to avoid the death penalty. So given the fact that today has already been kind of laid out in the, the agreement at the plea bargain, um, it, today's about the emotion of this case and sending a message uh, of the, 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 the greater subject of, uh, of, of racism, isn't it? Yeah, I think today is all about emotion. It's about giving the victims and the family of the victims the opportunity for some kind of closure, to make statements about racial uh, issues and strife. Uh, and then on the defense side, like I say, contrition, apology, again, strategy to influence the federal case. And I'm sure it's making some wonder whether if there is an apology, whether it will be a heartfelt apology or whether it's really just a play to, a, a play to save his life in the federal case. Yeah, I think that you're gonna find some people who he can say anything and they're not going to buy it. And there will be others who maybe think that some progress is there as a result of that. You know, the defense has hired a so-called mitigation expert those are people who go around coming up with reasons why they believe there shouldn't be a death penalty imposed on individuals. So that, that person's already in this case. So they have a strategy to do that today. Well, well, we'll see how things play out as the morning progresses, but uh, we'll be checking back in with you. Thanks very much, Paul Cambria. And once again, the sentencing of Peyton Gendron, the top smash shooter, was expected to start at 930. We do have a crew in there. We are streaming it live. However, nothing has happened yet, so that's why we're giving you this coverage right now. But as soon as things begin in court, we will take you live inside the courtroom where that sentencing uh, will be allowed to play out, be played out as it's happening. Yeah, and as we mentioned, it's going to be a very long, emotional morning where we're going to be hearing from the families who lost a loved one during the shooting or a family member of someone who is injured or potentially someone who is injured themselves. And we want to go back live now to Channel 2's Heather Lee, who is live outside the courthouse. And Heather, again, how many families do we expect to hear from? What can we expect to hear from them today? Pete, Melissa, good morning once again. We're expecting to hear from uh, between 17 and 19 families. And again, this could be a very lengthy court appearance. And unlike some of the other uh, court appearances that we may have covered previously, uh, we talked to one local defense attorney, a legal analyst, Frank Latempio, and he said that in some other cases, judges may limit the amount of time that is dedicated to victim impact statements or limit the number of people who could talk. But he's thinking that in this case, because number one, so many families were affected, but also 
also because it was such a high profile case that he's really going to give them the time and allow them the time to let their statements breathe and really have each and every one of those families that chooses to speak to the gunman directly in court and speak to those in the courtroom. One person that we will not hear from today is Mark Talley. His mother, Geraldine Chapman Talley, was one of the 10 people killed at the tops back on May 14th of last year. We had the chance to speak with him. He's been very active in the community, doing things for Friends of Night people and other local organizations in memory of his mother. But he said the one thing again that he will not do is be in that courtroom today. He said that it would be a privilege for the gunman to be able to hear him speak. He's not going to give him that opportunity. And we've got a little bit of sound from Mark Talley. We're going to go ahead and play that for you. Again, just the raw emotion, the anger, the sadness coming through in his words. Be a privilege for him to hear me speak. So I refuse to give him that honor. Uh, he's beneath the lowest of the low. So therefore, I don't I don't need to be in his same presence. And throughout the weeks and months following the tops mass shooting, we had the opportunity to learn more about each one of these victims, the things that they stood for, the things that their families wanted us to remember. Geraldine Talley's family said that she learned shortly before her death that she was about to become a first time grandmother. One of the other things that they said that she loved was spending time by the water. And actually the morning of the shooting, she spent three hours with her fiance at the foot of ferry, just taking in the nice weather and enjoying the day and it was later that afternoon that the two of them went to the tops on Jefferson Avenue to just pick up something for dinner, cold cuts, and she sent her fiance back for sweet tea. And when he went to the back of the store, that is when he heard those gunshots. Sadly, she was one of the 10 victims that died that day. But again, her son Mark Talley saying that he wants her to be remembered for the good that she did in her community. And again, all of the things that, uh, the good that she did for her community, he's trying to do those same things, helping out various organizations to keep her memory alive to to keep her spirit alive but again the one thing he will not do is give the gunman the time of day in the courtroom today there are others however who want to be there we heard from um uh, local defense attorney uh, Paul Cambria, he said that obviously it's going to be a very emotional day and there are family members who they want their moment in court and they want their moment to speak directly to the gunman Heather Lee reporting live outside court. We'll check back in with you in a few. And yeah, Mark Taylor is one of those people, as Heather just mentioned, who is trying to create positive change from this massacre, this tragedy. And he started an organization called Agents for Advocacy. They've got a huge fundraiser this weekend. Um, that was built out of his sorrow and his passion for creating positive change in our community. So many of these victims families are not letting this bring them down, but building them up in order to make some positive change on Buffalo's east side and our community to see something good come from this tragedy. Yeah, and everyone's trying to process in their own ways. And we're going to be hearing so many different things. But what we need to remember through this whole day, through the whole court proceedings and moving forward is the people who were lost and let's take a moment to, to reflect on those lives those people who lost their life on may 14th 2022 Catherine massey hayward patterson celestine cheney andre mcneil marcus morrison pearl young geraldine talley roberta drury ruth whitfield and aaron salter jr all right and now the sentencing of peyton gendron the shooter of the mass top shooting on May 14th is beginning now. So we're going to take you live inside the courtroom. Can we have the defendant? The record will reflect that the defendant is present in the courtroom in custody, and we are here today for purposes of sentencing. 
Before we get started, I would like to note for the record that I have received numerous media requests regarding the coverage of this case. I have issued an order allowing for a pool camera to video and audio record this proceeding and live stream the proceeding. Our local CBS news affiliate, WIVB, has been designated as that pool camera. There will also be a designated pool still photographer here from the Buffalo News. Please be advised that no other individuals or entities have been approved or are permitted to record this proceeding in any way. And I would ask all spectators to silence their cell phones and um, refrain from using their cell phones during this proceeding. Both the Buffalo News and WIVB are prepared to share the images and footage that they have captured. No photos, video, or live stream footage may be taken of those sitting in the gallery. Additionally, not all of the victims that wish to speak here today wish to be on video, and I will identify those individuals uh, to the media, and I would ask that no videos or still photos be taken of those individuals. I trust that you will honor the order of this court and the wishes of these victims. Additionally, Part 22 on the fourth floor will be available following this proceeding for the press to gather uh, for any statements from the parties. Is counsel uh, ready to proceed in this matter? Yes, Your Honor. All right. I would just ask that all counsel enter their appearance on the record, starting with the people. Sure. John Carolina for the people. Justin Caldwell for the people. Gary Hackworth for the people. Noah Elmikip for the people. Ryan Haggerty for the people. Thank you. Robert Cutting for Peyton Gendron. Dan Dubois on behalf of Mr. Gendron. Brian Parker on behalf of Mr. Gendron. Thank you. The people have indicated that they are ready to proceed. Is the defense ready to proceed? We are. Mr. Fairlock. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the people did receive a copy of the pre-sentence investigation report. Can we you use the microphone, Mr. Yes. Fairlock? Uh, the people have received a copy of the pre-sentence investigation report. Uh, we find no errors or omissions. Uh, Today, we anticipate that the court will hear from uh, the following people. Uh, on behalf of Erin Salter, uh, Kimberly Salter. Uh, she had previously advised that she did not wish to be video recorded, although I have been informed by our victim advocate that she has changed her mind and she is okay uh, with her statements being video recorded. On behalf of Celestine Cheney, Wayne Jones. On behalf of Roberta Drury, Leslie Van Giesen. On behalf of Andre McNeil, Deja Brown, and Vian Elliott. On behalf of Catherine Massey, Damone Maps, Demetrius Massey, and Adrian, I'm sorry, Adrian Massey and Barbara Maps. On behalf of Mangus Morrison and Pearl Young, Michelle Spite. On behalf of Ruth Whitfield, uh, Simone Crowley and Sasha Crowley. On behalf of Geraldine Talley, Brian Talley, and Tamika Harper. On behalf of Jennifer Warrington, Stephanie Waters, on behalf of Zaire Goodman, uh, Zanita Everhart, and Christopher Braden will speak on his own behalf. After the court hears from those individuals, Assistant District Attorney Justin Caldwell will address uh, the court with comments on behalf of the District Attorney's Office. Thank, Thank you. you. So, Mr. Farrelletto, given your comments um, concerning Ms. Salter, uh, to your knowledge, are there any of the victims that will speak today that do not wish to be videotaped? No, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. And um, you would ask that they come forward before uh, Mr. Caldwell speaks, is that what you said? Yes, Your Honor. All right. So at, at this time, ladies and gentlemen, any um, victims that wish to come forward to speak to the court, you may come forward. And I would ask that you um, process up to the podium along this side of the courtroom, my right, your left, um, and that all of the victims remain on this side of the courtroom and not approach um, from the other side. So uh, at this time, I would leave it to the DA's office. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kimberly Salter. And I stand here this morning on behalf, on behalf and with my husband, Aaron Salter. 
my family and I are here this morning and we wear red and black. Red for the blood that he shed for his family and for his community and black because we are still grieving. Today I share with you as it is written in God's word. You will reap what you sow, more than you sow, later than you sow. It is your choice. God is love and he offers love to each and every one of us. It is written in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I will also read Psalm 35. The Lord, the avenger of his people, a psalm of David. Plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. Also draw out the spear and stop those who pursue, who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let those who put to shame, let those be put to shame who bro and brought to dishonor who seek after my life. Let those be turned back and brought to confusion who plot my hurt. Let them be like chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery and let the angel of the Lord pursue them. For without cause they have hidden their net for me in a pit, which they have dug without cause for my life. Let destruction come upon him unexpectedly and let his net that he has hidden catch himself. And to that very destruction, let him fall. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say. Lord, who is like you? Delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him. Yes, the poor and the needy from him who plunders him. Fierce witnesses rise up. They ask me things that I do not know. They reward me evil for good to the sorrow of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting and my prayer will return to my, my own heart. I paced about as though he were my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one who mourns for his mother. But in my adversity, they rejoiced and gathered together. Attackers gathered against me and I did not know it. They tore at me and did not cease. With ungodly markers at feasts, they gnashed at me with their teeth. Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue me from their destructions, my precious life from the lions. I will give you thanks in the great assembly. I will praise you among many people. Let them not rejoice over me, who are wrongfully my enemies nor let them wink with the eye who hate me without a cause. For they do not speak peace, but they devise deceitful matters. Against the quiet ones in the land, they also opened their mouths wide against me and said, aha, our eyes have seen it. This you have seen, O Lord, do not keep silence. O oh Lord, do not be far from me. 
Stir up yourself and awake to my vindication, to my cause, my God and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, in their hearts, ah, so we would have it. Let them not say we have swallowed them up. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who rejoice at my hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who exalt themselves against me. Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified. Who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant? And my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and of your praise all day long. And so it is. This is the reading from God's word. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Sullivan. I'm very sorry for your loss. Thank you. I'm here on the behalf of the grandchildren of Ruth Elizabeth Whitfield, Tiffany, Camila, Jasmine, Felicia, myself, Simone, Garnell III, and Sasha. Our grandmother, our grandmother went to buy seeds for her garden on May 14th, 2022. She may not have been able to plant those seeds but the seeds that she planted throughout her life are abundant. The same way she brought us together on Ridge Street is the same way she brought unity and solidarity to the masses. We fondly remember waking up from our sleepovers to the smell of Sunday dinner while getting ready for church. She was the driving force for our fishing trips and our camping adventures. Our grandmother had a strong and resilient spirit. She will not be present for our milestones, but we stand strong and determined and triumphant in ways that you could never fathom. We find strength in knowing that her legacy will outlive you. You will simply go from a name to a number. You will be herded like cattle. You will be shut away from the world. You will not enjoy family events. You will not enjoy outings with friends. You will be nameless and faceless, and we feel sorry for you. We pity you even. Your life was meaningless before May 14th, 2022 and you woke up every day feeling small. You clearly did not value your own life, which allowed you to devalue the lives of others. Even with all of the heartache that you have caused, you still have failed to break our family spirit. You thought you broke us, but you awoke us. We all know the pure hatred and motivations behind your heinous crime, and we are here to tell you that you failed. We will continue to elevate and be everything that you are not, everything that you hate, and everything that you intended to destroy. Despite our battle scars, we will not, you will not win the war. We had a praying grandmother who taught us that the battle is not yours, it is the Lord's. The global outpouring of support and love, not only for our family, but for everyone within the black community has spoken volumes and it reiterates your failure. You are a cowardly racist, Every single person that has been instrumental in molding you and supporting you and informing you, aiding and supplying weapons needs to be held accountable and not protected as they have been. You recorded the last moments of our loved ones' lives to garner support for your hateful cause, but you immortalized them instead. We are extremely aware that you are not a lone wolf, but a pawn of a larger organized network of domestic terrorists. And to that network we say, we as a people are unbreakable. Our dear grandmother, our dear grandmother, Ruth Elizabeth Whitfield, 
She taught us the power of love. And even in our darkest hour, we will ensure that her legacy will be that of love. Thank you. I, I'm sorry for your loss. It is, it's not necessary for those who wish to speak to stand um, waiting for your turn. We will wait for you to approach the podium. So if you would like to take a seat um, and be more comfortable, you're welcome to do so. I'm Wayne Jones, only child of Celestine Cheney. I watched you kill my mom. I watched you on the internet. I watched you shoot her once, reload, and shoot her again. I just want you to remember that name and what you did. On March 14th, you killed Celestine Cheney, Rabita Dury, Andrew McAuley, Kathleen Mosley, Markel, Marcus Morrison, Haywood Patterson, Andrew Saunders, Geraldine Talley, Ruth Winfield, and Pearl Young. These are the names of the victims you decided to kill that day. Here are some of the names of the, the lives you've changed forever. Wayne Jones Sr., Wayne Jones Jr., Kayla Jones, Sharon Reed, Shana Jones, Donnell Jones, Nasir Jones, you took from us a loving mother, grandmother, sister, aunt, cousin, and friends. Behind your senseless act, we will never have another birthday, another get-together, another celebration, me and her shopping, another call on the phone like we often like to do. While I was writing this, tears fell from my eyes. Think about what a beautiful person you took. <laughs> because of your hate, which you've learned from the internet, I'm not going to drag this out long. I just want to remember some of the things that I want you to remember some of the things that I've said to you. I've seen you a couple times in court, and you look like a young man that could be anybody's son. You don't come across to me as a racist killer, even though that's what you have done. Mistakes. Some are big, and some are small. This one here is a real big one that you can't take back. You have to live with this one, bro, just as I have to live with this every day. I don't know what your relationship with your parents are, but I'm a parent, and I feel sorry for your parents. You will never get to hug them again, like I won't. You will never get to see your grandparents again. You will never see the outside world again. I don't wish the death penalty on you. I wish they keep you alive. So you have to suffer with the thought of what you did for the rest of your life. To me, killing you is the easy way out. One day, I hope you find it in your heart to apologize to those 10 families who you've shattered their lives for some senseless, <laughs> unnecessary business that you had going on with yourself.
you have shattered a lot of lives here, son. I got a child your age. I know it was a mistake. It was a big one, bro. You're going to pay for this. Just find it in your heart to apologize to these people, man. I've been there, man. You've been brainwashed. The internet is the issue. They bring, you're only 18. You can, obviously, you couldn't hate. You don't even know black people that much to hate them. You learned this on the internet, and it's a big mistake. I feel sorry for your mother, your mother. I don't have mine, but your mother, she's dying inside for what you've done. She can't even pick her head up behind some nonsense that you've done. And I hope you find that in your heart. To apologize to these people, man. You did wrong for no reason. That's all I got to say. Thank you, Mr. Jones. I'm sorry for your loss. Leslie Van Giesen. I represent Roberta Jory's family. My daughter, Robbie Jory, was a young woman. She was not married. She had no children. She never will. Robbie was our youngest daughter. When people ask, how many children do you have? I don't know what to say. Will I ever be able to enjoy August 11th, her birthday? May 14th, how will my family ever have a nice thought on a beautiful spring day? How do I look at her Christmas stocking hanging every year? Today, when I think of Robbie, I don't think of her like this. I need this picture to remind me she was a beautiful girl. I think of her alone, laying on the pavement hours. I've never been able to see or touch her after that day. I have been profoundly changed. My life view is it's just saddened everything. Robbie's family, my family, has been permanently damaged and there is no punishment that will ever reserve, reverse our loss. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Van Giesen. I'm very sorry for your loss. Our family's aunts are more or less our second moms. And that's what you took away from me. You took away my mom, best friend. You destroy our lives forever. It's not a day that goes by that I won't remember May 14th and being Two minutes sooner, I could have been in that store. And all I think about is, could I have saved my aunt? Could I have helped her get away from the bullets? Or could my mom be suffering more and lose her daughter, her granddaughter, and her sister? So in life, everything that happens, happens for a reason. 
And that's good and bad. At 18, at 19 years old, I had to bury my first son. But the pain I feel from you thanking my aunt from her family will never even compare to burying my own child. This was the, a horrible crime that you committed. And I hope you do pray for forgiveness. Because you know, not forgiving, I'll be blocking my own blessings. So do I hate you? No. Do I want you to die? No. I want you to stay alive. I want you to think about this every day of your life. Every day of your life, think about my family and the other nine families that you've destroyed forever, forever. May 14th will never be the same for me. My aunt was my grandchildren's godmother, and she was taken away on my granddaughter's birthday. My granddaughter will never be able to celebrate her birthday on May 14th. It hurts so bad. It hurts so bad. But I'm going to pray for you. And I want everyone to just pray for all the families that we can get through this because right now, Almost a year later, I still feel like my life will never be the same, ever. It'll never be the same. Thank you. I'm sorry for your loss. My name is Barbara Massey. I'm Catherine Massey's sister. You killed my sister. Cat, I'm going to tell you about my sister, Cat. Cat weighed 110 pounds, 72 years old. Cat would do anything for anybody, anytime. Cat was intelligent. She was a teacher. She was my best friend. She was anything at any given time. Cat was a protector. If Cat saw you, she probably went in her pocket and gave you some money, even though you didn't need it. Cat was an aunt. She was a great aunt. She was a cousin. She was a friend. Cat said she was a committee of one. There's nothing Cat wouldn't do for people. I want personally to choke you and leave my fingerprints on your neck because it was unnecessary. You leave 200 miles to come to Buffalo. You don't even know any black people. 95.7, that's what they said for the census in your town. You don't know an Indian, a Mexican, nobody. Your little punk ass decided to come and kill my sister. I talked to Cat every single day. You don't make Cat happy kids. Cat didn't have any children, but she said she had 34,000. That was the number of kids in school. Cat had so many children, our mind went boom with her own money. There's nothing Cat would do for anybody. You know what made Cat happy? Us cutting grass that we don't even own. That made my sister happy. That's what I was doing when you killed Cat. I was doing her lawn. I was there eight hours with my family, begging the cops, is my sister okay? You blew off her fucking back of her head, man. You okay? 110 pounds, 72 years old. I want to. You better stick those places. You better say, cops, thank y'all for protecting me, because I will hurt you so bad. You have made me sick. You got my family crying. I miss my sister every day. I live three doors down from Cat. I talk to Cat four times a day. My brother Ward goes up there and sit in the park with Cat like to be. My son called Cat triple black because she was so proud of her heritage. My nephew said Cat was a saint among sinners. My sister, Kathy Vassie, was a great person. Kat didn't hurt anybody. None of these families did. You're going to come to our city and decide you don't like black people. Man, you don't know a damn thing about black people. We're human. We like our kids to go to good schools. We love our kids. We never go in no neighborhoods and take people out. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it.
You're watching live coverage of the sentencing and the, the victim's statements uh, in, in the, uh, the county courthouse right now in state Supreme Court yeah, and just, raw emotion. Right. You were just hearing from Barbara Massey, who is the sister of Topps victim Catherine Massey. Barbara, as she was walking up to the podium, said, I am not going to be nice. She was emotional as she was yelling at Peyton Gendron, who is the Topps mass shooter. She is one of those to give a victim impact statement today, the most emotional and angry that we've heard today. As she was giving that statement, a man lunged at Peyton Gendron, and as you saw, there were security guards who escorted the shooter out of the courtroom. There was a scuffle in the courtroom. It now seems to be more under control, but we're waiting for it to, uh, to start back up again as things get uh, settle down and calm down a little bit. Raw emotion, sorrow, sadness, mourning from so many of the victim's family members. But with Barbara Massey, the sister of Catherine Massey, she was angry, clearly, and she showed it today. Yeah, and Barbara Massey was in stark contrast to the previous uh, victim's family members that we heard from who said, I, I, to, a, to a person said, I don't want to see I don't want to see you die. I, I want you to live with this every day of your life. I want you to remember the, the lives of the families that you destroyed. Right, and there's the, the emotions run the gamut because from all of the victims, family members that we've heard so far, they said, I want you to live. I want you to ask for forgiveness. I want you to live with this the rest of the, every day of your life. But for the sister of Catherine Massey, she was angry and said, I want to hurt you and, yeah. and, and do more than that. She also said, you don't know black people. We are, uh, she's, her exact words, we, uh, we, you don't know black people, we are human. And she referred a lot to him coming here specifically to shoot and kill black people in that top supermarket and was angry about it. Yeah, and she it went to the point of uh, talking about the demographics of Peyton Gendron's hometown being more than 95% white. He says she went on to say, you don't know minorities, you don't know us, you came this way just to destroy lives. And uh, we also, it, it was interesting watching Peyton Gendron's uh, body language. He made sure he was looking each and every one of them in the eyes. He, he teared up and cried at certain points. And it, uh, it, we, we don't have confirmation, but it appears that he's wearing uh, a vest underneath his, his, prison, his prison fatigues. Yeah, some of the other people that we heard from before this scuffle in the courtroom, so that was Barbara Massey, the uh, sister of Catherine Massey. Before that was the niece of Geraldine Talley. She said to Peyton Gendron, she said, do I hate you? No. Do I want you to die? No. I want you to stay alive. I want you to think about this every day of your life. Prior to that was the mother of the mass shooting victim, Roberta Robbie Drury, who showed a baby picture of Roberta Drury in court. And she was speaking through tears and said, there is no punishment that will ever reverse our loss. Yeah. Prior to that, there was Wayne Jones. He's the son of Celestine Cheney. And he said, mistakes, some are big, some are small. This right here is a real big one that you can't take back. You've got to live with this one, bro. And prior to that was a woman representing the grandchildren of Ruth Whitfield, who gave a victim impact statement. And she said to Gendron, you thought you broke us, but you awoke us. Despite our battle scars, you will not win the war you are a cowardly racist. Yeah, and Kimberly Salter, the wife of Aaron Salter Jr. spoke, uh, and she made a point of saying, look at what we're wearing. We're wearing red and black. 
because we're wearing red for the blood that uh, that you caused our, our loved one to shed and we're wearing black because we are in mourning. Right. So we did get through many of the victim impact statements so far, but still we are to hear from the family members of Andre McNeil, Marcus Morrison and Pearl Yun. And then we will also hear from the three survivors. We'll hear from Jennifer Warrington and Zaire Goodman's mother. And then we will also hear from Christopher Braden himself. He was shot in that May 14th shooting and he survived. And so we will be hearing from him as well. And once again, uh, one point that's been kind of uh, ringing true through all of the victim statements with the exception of uh, that last one from Barbara Massey, uh, that was, I mean, the anger was, was palpable, uh, which is why we're in a pause right now in the courtroom. But they wanna make sure that he remembers each one of his victims as a person and their names. Catherine Massey, Hayward Patterson, Celestine Cheney, Andre McNeil, Margus Morrison, Pearl Young, Geraldine Talley, Roberta Drury, Ruth Whitfield, and Aaron Salter. Yeah. We are paused here during the sentencing of Peyton Gendron because if you missed it just a few minutes ago, Barbara Massey, who is the sister of Catherine Massey, was giving her victim impact statement. It became very emotional. We'll show you the video right now of what exactly happened, but she was emotional and yelling at Gendron, and then all of a sudden, as you're watching it happen here, this is a man who's lunging at Gendron. We are not sure who he is. And then they quickly escorted Peyton Gendron out of the courtroom. If, are we able to pull up Paul Cambria's mic? Because I have a few questions for him. Uh, our legal analyst, Paul Cambria, is here. Paul, obviously a lot of court security here. Have you ever seen anything like this happen in a courtroom before? And what needs to happen now to get the sentencing back underway? Yes, I have. Uh, actually, I've had cases where um, there was great violence in the courtroom where the defendant went after the prosecutor for statements that were made. And of course, uh, many years ago, I was with the infamous Larry Flint when they shot him and my local counsel in front of me. Uh, so yes, I've seen this, and it's, uh, to you, uh, you know, it's commendation to the court staff. They were prepared. I mean, this was a case that had a great potential of having something like this happen, and they were prepared and they acted quickly. And you notice that the protocol is to immediately take the defendant out to obviously have somebody in front of the judge and to then, you know, uh, quiet, if you will, the rest of the courtroom and the, and the person who's the problem. But this is not unusual. I, we see these across the country in cases uh, you know, emotions are high. People lose family members and so on. And I mean, this, it doesn't get any, any better than that. And it was interesting that the prior speakers were extremely, extremely eloquent mm -hmm. and really, uh, I think, made a, a great impression uh, on the whole world because a lot of people are going to be seeing this around the country. Yeah, and I think a lot of people would have been expecting that type of response, pure anger, especially with the senselessness of this, the racist motivation. Um, is there anything that stood During out to you as uh, far as the uh, as far as the testimony that was given? Uh, actually, we're going to we're going to hold off on that for a moment, Paul. We're going to head back to the courtroom. They've uh, apparently restored order and are starting to resume. Fine. But I am sure that you are all disturbed by <clears throat> the physicality that we've seen in the courtroom here today. And, and I understand that emotion, and I understand the anger, but we cannot have that in the courtroom. And I am prepared to give anyone that needs to speak an opportunity to speak. Um, and I know that you need to address some of your comments to the defendant, but we must conduct ourselves appropriately because we are all better than that. And. So we will continue with the proceeding at this time. And anyone that is feeling overwhelmed by their emotions, I would ask that you perhaps step out in the hallway and take a moment to gather yourself. All right, it appears the pool feed of 
the sentencing, we've lost that, and hopefully we will get back to that very short. Now we have it back, we're told. All right, let's head back into the courtroom for the sentencing of Peyton Gendron. And as you can see, Peyton Gendron about to re-enter the courtroom. They brought him out of the courtroom for his own safety as things got very heated and tempers flared. Proceedings are just about to get back underway. The record will reflect that the defendant is uh, present in the courtroom and we are ready to proceed. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Zanetta Everhart and I am here on behalf of my son, Zaire Goodman. On May 14, 2022, my son Zaire Goodman was at work doing what young people do. He was working at his part-time job and then terror struck. A terrorist shot Zaire point blank in the neck and the bullet fragments tore through his body and exited his back. He miraculously survived, but his life is now forever changed. Over the last several months, his life has been all about going to the doctor, seeing therapists, and trying to make peace with knowing that someone came into his community and tried to kill him because of the color of his skin. And then questioning why his life was spared when 10 others did not survive. It is an understatement to say that he has survivor's guilt. He is dealing with the pain that I, as a mother, cannot heal. The ideology to which this terrorist carried out this attack by some is labeled as a sickness or a disease. It is not. Racism, hatred, and white supremacy are lifestyles that are chosen. On that day, Zaire chose to get up and go to work. And that terrorist chose to drive a few hundred miles to shoot and kill 10 people and seriously injure three others. As humans, we have the ability to decipher right from wrong and make choices accordingly. No matter what choice we make, we have to deal with the consequences of that choice, good, bad, or indifferent. On that day, this terrorist made the choice that the value of a black human meant nothing to him. The disregard he has for human life and the callousness to which he carried out this attack on my son and my community not only makes him a monster, but a coward. Only a hu weak human takes out their pain on others. The world says you have to forgive in order to move on. But I stand before you today to say that will never happen. Forgiveness to me puts this tragedy in the laps of the victims and I nor my son will accept the responsibility of his terroristic act. This is his and his alone. It is he who will need to ask for forgiveness. As he lay in his cell late at night, when he can't sleep. I hope that he is thinking of the 10 lives that he stole from us. I want him to think about my son, who he shot, and the other survivors. I want him to think about the community he tried to destroy. And when the sun comes up, I want him to know that that is Zaire. That is my son, Zaire, my son, Goodman, showing you that what you did to him hurt, but he continues to shine. Whatever the sentence is that he receives, it will never be enough to pay for the damage that he has caused. I hope that he receives the fate that he deserves. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Stephanie. On May 14th at 11 a.m., I was on a Zoom with the group I've been in for years called Erase. Our slogan is Eracism. We seek through person-to-person -person communication to eradicate the disease of racism and white supremacy. A few hours after my Zoom ended, I called my sister to visit with her. She answered the phone. She said, Steph, I'm in an ambulance. 
I've been shot in the head. If I die, please be there for my children. A lot of people have been killed. Please ask everyone that we know to pray. I begged her to stay on the phone, not knowing if I would ever speak to her again. She hung up and I headed to the airport. It wasn't until I was sitting in the airport, in the plane, that my nephew called and said, Aunt Steph, it was a white supremacist. He filmed the entire thing on live stream. I groaned and roared and screamed so loudly that the plane was delayed in taking off. I roared in pain for my sister, my beautiful sister, pharmacist who was serving in the east side. I never knew if I would see her again. I roared also in pain for my brothers and sisters who do not look like me or like the defendant. I roared in pain because he bought into the lies of this country that somehow, because of the amount of the chemical in our skin, we are superior. We were not even the first ones here in the US. Okay? Our black and brown brothers and sisters endured centuries, not years, centuries of oppression as they built our buildings and produced our crops by which the foundation of this country was built on. They continue to endure oppression. Even the Harvard lawyer is mistaken continually in the courtroom for the defendant and not the, not the lawyer. They continue to endure microaggressions. They continue to have their families gunned down simply because of the color of their skin. You heard some of the family members today reading from the Bible, offering forgiveness, offering peace, showing the beauty of their hearts. Yes, you also saw the fury. And for those who serve, who I have to ask people to sit, I ask you to do it with an empathy in your heart and an understanding that for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, we have been looking at our brown brothers and sisters as if they were less than. They are not less than. They deserve our respect. They deserve our radical empathy. They deserve for us to get educated on what we can do to treat them with the respect that they deserve. I'm speaking not only for my sister who served in the East Side. My mother's not with me. She's a teacher on the East Side. She's teaching today. Our father, my late father, was a cancer research scientist, master's and a PhD. He dedicated his life to serving. For the last 30 years on the East Side, he ran a mission, helping people that deserve to be here, that deserve to be helped. So I ask you, Judge, I wish you could promise that the defendant would never have access to social media for the time that he's alive. I know that's not practical, but I would ask you, the defendant, please, please consider the possibility that you were wrong and that we are stronger together. Diversity makes us beautiful. If every color in the palette was the same color, we would have no beauty in anything in this world. Diversity in the body makes us strong. If every finger was a pinky, we couldn't do anything. We are stronger together. A house divided cannot stand. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Christopher Braden. It has been less than a year since you attacked me and 12 others that day, along with countless numbers of TOPS employees, customers, and residents of that area. I still remember May 14th, 2022, and everything about it still haunts me. Your actions have completely changed and impacted my life in every aspect. I cannot even begin to feel, describe the feeling of terror I had on that Saturday afternoon when I was attacked by you. I was shot in the leg, um, I was shot on the inside of my leg just above my knee and the bullet exited outside below my knee, taking almost everything with it. Uh, the injuries I sustained were severe, but I remained conscious and coherent the entire time. I unfortunately saw a few victims being killed. As I was being taken out of the store after the shooting was over, I saw all the victims where they lay. The visions haunt me in my sleep every night and most days. I cannot get those memories out of my head. Nighttime is the worst for my PTSD. I have night terrors that jerk me awake in the middle of the night, and I'm unable to calm back down to go back to sleep. Loud noises never mottled me before, but they do now. 
I am always on edge and hyper vigilant about my surroundings, feeling the need to be always on alert and protect myself. I spent 10 days in the hospital, endured four surgeries with two more surgeries to go. My left leg below my knee was nearly lost had it not been for the excellent work of my surgeons and the entire team at ECMC. It takes me at least 15 minutes every morning just to get out of bed because my left leg and foot don't work as they should. Without the brace on my foot, it drags and I am not able to flex it. I have no feeling from my knee down to my toe. Both of these things are permanent. I just started being able to put my own sock on and shoe, although some shoes I still have trouble with. I am frustrated with the things that I haven't been able to do since my injury. I could speak for hours about my injuries and treatment, as well as the permanency of these injuries. The stress of not being able to return to work, the pain I suffered hospitalized that continues to this day, um, extensive rehab I have gone through. However, I would rather talk about being a survivor. I am still the same person that I was before you did this to me. My scars and pain remind me of how strong I have become. I am more alive and stronger than ever. You haven't taken away my will to live. You haven't broken my spirit. The scars are a constant reminder of what happened to me, but don't define my future. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Brian Talley. I'm here on behalf of Geraldine Talley and my nephew, Mark Talley. Um, Peyton Gendron. Peyton Gendron. The reason I mention your name is because so many people have spoke about it not to say anything, not to mention your name. But you need to be known. You need to be known worldwide. I've done a little history on you too, Peyton. Um, I watched a video. You know, and I just can't believe what can you say, what can you possibly say after putting on a video of killing people? It was like a video game to you. What can you possibly say to anybody? Your words don't mean anything. After this, I'm leaving because I don't want to hear what you have to say. It doesn't make a difference. I'm going to give you a little history lesson. The Willie Lynch Doctrine the making of a slave. It said you take the biggest, the toughest, and the blackest near. You take them. You tie a horse to one arm. You tie a horse to the other arm. You tie a horse to one leg and tie a horse to the other leg. And then you rip them apart in front of every slave to let you know what it is. You did that to us. You came into the biggest part the strongest part of the black community, and you ripped us apart. How can you possibly get any kind of, how can you possibly stand up here and say that you're sorry? That you're sorry, you're playing this whole thing. You planned it, you put it on a video, like it was a video game, and watched it. I watched my sister-in-law get shot by you. I watched it. I went in the tops a couple of times, and every time I go in there, only thing plays out in my mind is where you walked, where you shot, what you did. You know, the hatred that you must have in your heart for black people, I will never understand. I don't want to understand it. But I must say this, I pray to God they do not kill you. Because I've been incarcerated, you know, I have, and I know where you're going, where you go in solitary confinement for the rest of your life by yourself, wearing this color green? That's why I wore green today, because I want you to remember this color. You're going to be wearing this color for the rest of your life. I'm praying that you wear this for the rest of your life. I will say this. My nephew didn't come today because of the hate and the pain that he feel, and I don't blame him. I do not blame him because he's still hurting. This whole community is hurting, man. You know, you broke it, you, you divided this community so much that it's, it, it's painful. We'll never heal for this. Can you imagine, you wake up on a Sunday morning and you're going shopping, and you're going shopping on a graveyard? Because that's what Tops is now, it's a graveyard. Huh. It is a graveyard. 
Can you imagine going to buy your grocery at Forest Lawn, right in the middle of Forest Lawn right now? Well, that's what you did. And if you look at the community right now on Jefferson Avenue, after all the hype and everything, nothing has changed. As a matter of fact, it's got even worse. It's got even worse. Stores is closed down. The community is totally devastated. And you did this. I, but I pray to God for your soul. I forgive you. But I forgive you not for your sake, but for mine and for this black community. I forgive you. Because that's the only way we're going to heal. But you can best believe I will never forget your name. I will follow you. Every, every your parole, whenever you whatever you're going through, I'm gonna follow you, just like you followed us, just like you sat down and you followed us. I will always remember your face. I will never ever forget you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Michelle. My last name is Spite. I lost an aunt on May 14th and a cousin. What are the chances that two of your family members would be in the same place from two different sides of your family? This is the first time I really had to process this for myself as I've been an advocate for my families that couldn't be as strong to speak for themselves. The calculated manifesto that you derived, the way that you started on a street that I grew up on, you journeyed down my grandmother's street and then wound up at Tops and killed two of my family members. My cousin Pamela Young, that was, Pearl Young was her mother. She was her only daughter. So I stand here to represent James Young, her son, Damon Young, her son, Pamela Young, her daughter, and all of her grandchildren, Oriana, Greg, Nate, and a host of others. I'm going to read Pamela's statement. She could not be here today. It's entitled Residency. What will take up residency? Will it be May 14th, 2022? or the court appearance, or every interview, or every time I've had to send my mother's death certificate to an insurance company with the cause of death being multiple gunshot wounds to the head. You didn't shoot her once, but you turned around and shot her two times. So much so that her, her viewing could not even be made by her family. I don't feign strength Great strength. Some mornings I wake up with questions of why my mother. I still recall the day I viewed my mother's body for the final time at the funeral home. Her face held no familiar semblance and I couldn't even get her wedding ring on her finger because so much of her was distorted. I am jealous of my friends and family because they can remember all the beauty of her smile and I grapple with my final image. But then I think, what has the right to take a residency in my mind? I remember being an eight-year-old girl traveling with her to UB as she completed her college degree. The experience of watching her earn her degree and realizing that I could attain one. She was my inspiration. I remember my mother's advice on the day of my marriage, her presence at the births of all three of my children. There, also, there was also a time nearly 15 years ago when she lived with me for six months. She needed to recover from a major surgery in a home where she could maneuver around easily. My mother spent those months with me and my husband. We drank coffee together and talked for hours. I was so grateful to be able to care for her as she had done for me throughout my childhood. I vividly recall October 31st, 2019, the night my husband passed away unexpectedly. 
I arrived at her house full of tears. She brushed my hair as I lay on her lap as if I were a five-year-old girl again. I have so many other memories that I've decided to write them in my journal. May 14th will always be a memory of a heinous and monstrous act of violence perpetuated by an angry man against my mother simply because of her race. An act of hatred and white supremacy. But I won't allow it to take up residency in my mind. Not when there is so much more about my mother that deserves residency there. So when my mind is invaded by May 14th, 2022, I will allow the tears to fall and the question of why to utter from my lips. But afterwards, I'll take out my journal to remember all the precious moments with my mother. Two minutes and three seconds won't steal those memories. But Peyton, I hope you are haunted every day and every night. I hope nightmares invade your sleep and convict and conviction be your constant companion. You came to Buffalo with hatred and anger in your heart. You terrorized a community, took the life of my best friend, but your anger and hatred is not greater than my love for my mother. Beautiful thoughts of her are in my mind as I write tonight. I, I'm reminded of one of my favorite scriptures and it says, now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Philippians 4 and 8. This will take up residency in my mind. Pamela Young Pritchett. And the final reading on behalf of the Morrison family, um, specifically um, Fred Morrison and his mother, who is 72, who on her birthday buried her son. Thanks, Peyton, for that. Dear sirs, the dreadful afternoon of May 14th was the day my world was turned upside down. My life has been altered in unimaginable ways. The sheer agony I felt waiting at the Mikowski School for the confirmation that my brother was one of the victims of this senseless massacre by a white supremacist is riveting. I never imagined my best friend, my only left brother, one who I shared holidays, birthdays, football game days, and most remarkably, our most precious gift we share in our mom. Now, all mom and I have left are a million questions of why, tons of lifeless pictures and a plethora of distant memories and countless tears of insurmountable pain. Thank you for that, Peyton. Oftentimes, my daily struggle is the feeling of not even wanting to live my life without him. Margus and I were inseparable. Margus was the middle son, the only living brother I had the one that fiercely protected me and my mother. He was preceded in death by my eldest brother who died suddenly from a heart attack. Now guess what, Peyton? I'm reliving the pain of loss all over again on an entire new level. Since his murder, I sometimes find myself challenged by not being able to sleep soundly, paranoia going through stores, and in my daily routine, always watching my back as if there was a target attached to me. The added responsibility of being the primary caretaker for our mother who suffered a stroke, in case you were concerned, and losing capacity to speak. I'm now left as the only child and pillow she sheds her tears of missing her baby boy Marcus Morrison on. No mother, no mother should have to bury their child, but my mother, buried her son, Margus, on her 72nd birthday. And Margus' daughter buried her dad on her 16th birthday. 
I hope you spend the rest of your life, every second, every minute, every hour, rehearsing the daunting sound of the screams and the echoes of the lives you snuffed out. I pray that when you blink your eyes, Peyton, you close them at night to sleep and you see images of the slain and feel the burden of the sorrow from every family member and friend of the fallen loved ones in our entire community of 514. I pray that every second and every minute of your 24 hours will haunt you as the absence of my brother at every birthday, holiday, game day, family gathering, and all the other times we share. They have now become nothing but gloom and grueling for me and my family. The fact that you can sit in this courtroom with no remorse, flat affect, emotionless, shows the essence of your privilege, sir. One that my brother never had and never will. The fact that you are surrounded by white officers after you casually surrendered while my brother's blood drained from his body is a testament to society that we have a long way to go. And some people's blood is just not as important as others. Thus the reason you lived and you have the privilege of being protected. Needless to say, there is one, and I must address you, there is one Peyton that sees all, and you will not escape the fury of the Almighty. One scripture is true in the Bible, and that is, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and he will repay. I pray he is merciful because I too need mercy. So I pray he is merciful to let you live so that you can be reminded of the innocent blood that my brother shed behind your calculated, sinister, demonic act that caused my beloved brother to be snatched from our family. If you don't know God, Peyton, I invite you to find him because you are going to need him. With deep sorrow, Fred Morrison, brother of Marcus Morrison. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. start off with saying my dad was Andre McNeil. He um, went to that store to get a cake for my little brother because May 14th is his birthday, my little brother's birthday. And he turned three years old and he didn't get to celebrate his birthday with his dad because he never came back. So um, I was told to write an impact statement. First I was being selfish and I said I wasn't going to do it, but then I remember I wasn't doing it for this selfish coward or the courts or the press, but I was doing it for my dad, my best friend who was snatched from this world because of something he couldn't change, the color of his skin. After I lost my uncle Bebe, my dad's brother, I made my dad promise me to stay on top of his house because I didn't want to lose him. And even though we had separation in life, once we did rekindle, we were inseparable. I called him for literally everything especially when I wasn't getting my way because I knew he would make a way. But most of all, I would be lost without him because I finally found somebody who understood me to a T. We thought a lot alike. And even though he had to be dad before a friend, I always respected everything he said. He was so wise and he made the world easier to live in because he had all the answers to my wild questions. When I was around him, I wanted, I wanted to know his every move, where he was going, what he was doing, and I made sure I tagged along. And the one time he leaves without me, he doesn't come back. After this happened, I constantly beat myself up about him going, 
And I'm still pissed off because he wasn't given a chance to fight. He was blindsided. You hit him and he didn't even know he got hit. He was blindsided by a hateful death at the hands of a selfish boy who was obviously not educated on the history of African Americans. And because of you murdering my dad, I'm pissed and I'm sad and I hate you. And I didn't think I would be strong enough to look you in the face and tell you this. And how much you hurt me, my little brother who's three years old and gotta grow up without his dad. His brothers, my dad's sisters, his nieces, nephews, his grandkids. Our dad, the man who created us, was killed by a little boy who was obviously raised by hateful people. And I hate your parents too, so let them know that. And there's nothing in this world, no amount of money, anything anyone could say that'll change how I feel. This is the worst way to lose someone. So close to you and I'll never forgive you. And I don't have it in me because no matter what, it wasn't my time, it wasn't my dad's time to go. And who are you to think you control that? My father, Andre McNeil Sr., his name will live on until the day I die. So you, I don't know what else to say to you. I just hope you feel bad. I really do. And I hope, I just hope you go through it in prison. That's all I got. Thank you. Good morning. Hello. I'm Dion Elliott. I am Andre McNeil's brother. Andre, me and Andre are 11 months and 8 days apart. On the 28th, I'll turn 53. On March 8th, he'll turn 54. Peyton, you took this from me. You took the last of my line. My mother died three days before 9-11. My brother, baby brother died in 2017. My father died in 2017. I'm all that's left besides my baby sister. But what I grew up with, you took from me, which was my brothers, my, my last, the oldest, the only one I had, the only one I could go to, you know, I became homeless, and he came in and found me and got me and brought me to his house. And shortly thus, after that, you know, he planned a party for my nephew and asked me to be here, you know, because of my work and trying to better my life. I didn't make it. But any other thing and any other day that he's in Auburn is where he lived. We were born and raised in Buffalo. Yes, we are from Buffalo. Yes, this is our home. So you took a lot from me. When you came into Buffalo and you drove past Auburn, you know, because Conklin's not that far from Auburn, actually. I don't understand why, you know, you came all the way to Buffalo when there was a million different black communities. But you shouldn't have came anywhere. You should have sat in your car first and thought about your actions. As an 18-year-old, I don't know how you could even continue on. I don't know who helped you, who talked you into it. You know, because I know a lot of 18-year-olds, white boys, so you know this. I know a lot of 18-year-old Caucasian, little friends of mine, I call them little homies. None of them are racist, so I'm confused. Especially the three that I know from Conklin, where you're from. So I'm confused on how you got past everybody with your ideology and all this nonsense you have all these protectors of you but so that you know that they're here now where you're going i've been and your own kind's going to get you just so you know i've been in that prison your own kind is going to get you everything that you think that you know about prison and whatever they told you is a lie. Trust me, I've been there. You can ask anybody here to look up my name and they'll find three different New York State ID numbers, which you're about to be. And your own kind's gonna get you. They're gonna befriend you. They're gonna do you real filthy. 
That's the sad part about it. But you took 53 years from me. You took the last of my life from me. All that I grew up with, all that I know is gone. All of it. It was all I had left. And you came in here in New Buffalo on May 14th and took that from me. I'll never understand why. I don't think anybody will. But you will get what you got coming. You will. That is a promise. As someone said, vengeance, God says vengeance is mine. He'll get you. He will get you for all of us. Do I hate you? No. Do I want to hurt you? Yes. And trust me and believe. These dudes can't stop me, really. I'm the littlest thing in here and very agile. But I don't want to hurt you. And I don't, I got nine children, ten children I got to go home to. Andre had five. And he can't even, they can't even see him anymore. And my nephew, my three-year-old nephew, Every day, he's calling for his father, and he, and, he, and he can't, and he's not coming. You know how bad that hurts? You know, it, it's sad when I got to ignore my nephew's phone calls to tell him his daddy's not coming. It's sad, because that's all he wants to know, and I don't have an answer. You took a lot from me. You took a lot from my family. But me, the last, I have no mother, no father, no brothers anymore. You know what you took? I don't understand. Your Honor, you've had an opportunity to hear from some of the victim's family members. They've spoken about the effect that this heinous, racially motivated act had on them, their family members, their friends, and their community. However, there are additional family members you've not heard from today. Some uh, wrote statements and chose not to speak. Others could not bear to write a statement and relive one of the most traumatic events of their lives. I would like to speak on behalf of all of those personally affected who chose not to submit a statement. And then I'd like to speak on behalf of the DA's office. Hayward Patterson's family members did not wish to speak today and did not submit a victim impact letter. Nonetheless, I can assure this court that their reluctance to speak or write a letter is because of how difficult this process is which everybody has seen today. Everyone who was in TOPS on May 14th of 2022 or knew someone who was killed on that day has experienced trauma that is not easy to speak about. Their absence is not an indication that they don't care about the outcome or that they've simply moved on. In actuality, it's an indication that they're still recovering and learning to cope and cannot yet bring themselves to confront the defendant or even articulate all of their feelings in a letter. I'd like to focus on the people who were at Top Supermarket on the day of the attack for a moment. While there are many people who escaped that horrible event alive and physically unharmed, they will be scarred emotionally for the rest of their lives. I visited the Top Supermarket where this all occurred in the aftermath of the incident. 
and it certainly had an immediate effect on me. And I was only present for a limited amount of time. I can't imagine what the survivors of this incident were going through during the incident as they remained hidden and quiet, hoping and praying that the defendant didn't find them and end their lives too. This time, Yarn, I'll speak on behalf of the DA's office. On May 14th of 2022, this defendant displayed a callous disregard for human life. He drove over 200 miles out of his way with one mission, with one goal, to kill as many black people as possible. During that three hour drive, he could have turned around, but he wouldn't be deterred. He was steadfast to accomplish his goal of killing as many black people as possible and starting a race war. He fed into propaganda and lies that convinced him that somehow these innocent people who he had never heard of, who had never heard of him, who had never had a conversation with him, who had never even met him, were a threat to his very existence and identity as a white man. The defendant executed 10 people and wounded three others in slightly over two minutes. The only time he expressed a scintilla of remorse or regret is when he apologized to Christopher Braden, a white man, for shooting him. Any statement of expression or remorse at this point, any tears fall flat in the face of such violent actions. And I wholeheartedly believe that the only other regret that the defendant has is that he didn't kill more black people before he was apprehended by Buffalo police officers. In fact, the defendant was so sure of his beliefs, which were based on lies and propaganda, that he live streamed his attack with the goal of inspiring others to commit similar attacks, with the goal of tearing this community down, with the goal of spreading hatred and fear. He failed. This community is pulled together. People of all races, sexual orientations, and religions working together to show love and unity for one another. On May 14th of 2022, 10 beautiful and innocent lives were violently taken from their family, friends, and community because the defendant subscribed to hateful ideology. However, their legacy won't be as victims struck down by someone with unfathomable hatred in his heart. But instead, it'll be as a beacon of light that has brought love to this community, that made this community stronger, that united people of all races throughout our community and our country. The defendant's legacy, on the other hand, will be of a cowardly murderer who killed unarmed citizens. The defendant thought that this would create enough tension to start a race war, that we would turn on each other, he thought that everyone has as much hate in their hearts as he does. But he was wrong, and again, he failed. This community showed that they are not as ugly as the defendant's hateful ideology, and instead of choosing violence, they chose love. They showed the world that the love of this community will always be stronger than white supremacist hatred. And hopefully, the defendant will have to live with his failure for the rest of his life in a jail cell while this community continues to flourish. Your Honor, this sentencing is an opportunity to say no to racism, to say no to hate. Our chance to hold this defendant accountable and show others that think like the defendant that these acts have no place in our society and that there will be dire consequences for anyone who tries to follow in his footsteps. I ask your honor to do what justice demands, to sentence this defendant to the maximum possible sentence allowable by our laws in New York State, to sentence him to a period of life without parole. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clinton. Have the people had an opportunity to review the pre-sentence investigation, and is there anything you'd like to make a record about with regard to that? We have had an opportunity to do it, and we have nothing to add, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Anything uh, further from the people? No, Your Honor. 
Thank you. Mr. Parker. I want to acknowledge that today is what I can only imagine. One of many solemn days in the lives of the survivors and the family members of those who died. Their words are heart-wrenching. Their loss, unimaginable. Only those who have lived it can truly understand their anguish. For the devastation that he caused, Peyton Gendron will be sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison with no possibility of ever being released. Our client committed these terrible crimes. He is responsible for his actions. And he will be held accountable. And he will suffer the consequences for what he did. This case highlights, however, a much deeper problem. This young man's violent, hate-fueled assault was in part the product of centuries of pervasive racism and discrimination in this country. These problems need to be addressed, just as many others have publicly demanded since this terrible event took place. Unfortunately, neither this proceeding nor any criminal trial can expose or address the historical racism that set the stage for our clients' horrible acts. We, as a community, need to have those conversations in our legislative bodies and in our living rooms to achieve meaningful change. We know that some of the families and their lawyers have asked for the information collected by law enforcement during their investigations of this crime. We support that request. We hope the resolution of this case brings the day for that information to be shared closer. The racist hate that motivated this crime was spread through online platforms. And the violence that was made possible was in part due to the easy access of assault weapons. Still, our client is responsible for this crime. He will spend the rest of his life locked away, and eventually he will die in state prison. We hope that knowing he will never be free again will offer some small bit of comfort to those that he hurt so much. Some of those most affected by his crime have expressed a need to know whether our client is remorseful. Remorseful for what he did and the devastation that he caused. We are aware, however, that for others, any expression of remorse would be meaningless in the very sight of him or the sound of his voice can be painful. At this time, he has a brief statement to make. His words are not in any way intended to inflict any further pain on those that have already suffered, and we hope that they do not do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. very sorry for all the pain I forced the victims and their families to suffer through. I'm very sorry for stealing the lives of your loved ones. I cannot express how much I regret all the decisions I made leading up to my actions on May 14th. 
I did a terrible thing that day. I shot and killed people because they were black. Looking back now, I can't believe I actually did it. I believed what I read online and acted out of hate. I know I can't take it back, but I wish I could. And I don't want anyone to be inspired by me and what I did. Has the defense had an opportunity to review the pre-sentence investigation, and is there any record you wish to make with regard to that? Uh, Judge, we have had a chance to review the pre-sentence report, and we have no comment on it at, at this point. Is there any further comment the defense wishes to make? No, we are ready for sentencing. Right. I would like to thank you all for being here. And to thank those of you who have shared your thoughts and feelings with the courts, either in writing or in open court here today. It is very meaningful to me, and I believe that it is important for the defendant and the world to hear what you have to say. I am very sorry for your losses and the pain that you feel. I would like to recognize the heroic officers of the Buffalo Police Department who without hesitation ran towards the danger of an active shooter call, swiftly and professionally stopping and containing the defendant and putting an end to his evil rampage. Thank you. I have spent a lot of time thinking about this case our community, our nation, how we got here, and where we go from here. It all comes down to character and having the strength to stand up for what is right. Our character is not defined by the good and easy times. It is defined by the hard and challenging times. And often, our character is revealed not necessarily by what we say, but by what we do. I am both immensely proud of and grateful for the way Buffalo has rejected the evil and hate that was inflicted on our community. The character of good people throughout this city, county, state, nation, and even internationally, has shown through as they have stood with the victims of this heinous and cruel act. This indictment speaks to the 13 victims and their families that lost the most, but they are not the only victims. There are thousands that have been traumatized directly and vicariously by this defendant's actions. We have seen the community turn out in support and are seeing signs of much needed change in East Buffalo. It is a testament to the power of love and compassion to overcome evil and hate by turning pain into purpose. But it is just the beginning. We have a long way to go. This hateful act and other similar hateful acts across the country, motivated by white supremacy and replacement theory, are a reckoning for us as a nation. The ugly truth is that our nation was founded and built in part on white supremacy, 
starting with the treatment of Native Americans by the first European settlers, to the cruel, inhumane, economic engine, nation-building practice of slavery, to indentured servitude, to Jim Crow laws, to government policies creating segregated public housing with communities of color often placed in environmentally hazardous locations, to the manner in which expressways were built, dividing urban neighborhoods to create easy access to government subsidized developments in the suburbs with restricted covenants prohibiting the sale of suburban homes to African Americans, to redlining practices in communities of color, further devaluing those neighborhoods, to the GI Bill, a well-deserved financial boon to our servicemen, unless, of course, you were a serviceman of color to the war on drugs and mass incarceration disproportionately of men of color, to the school to prison pipeline, to inequities in education, employment opportunities, and compensation, to the existence of food deserts and inadequacies in health care. Our history is replete with both individual and systemic discriminatory practices, many of them still firmly in place today. In fact, it is these very policies and practices that contributed to and made this atrocity possible. The effects of these policies, some current and others decades and centuries old, created the segregation in our city and enabled this defendant to research and identify his target to maximize the impact of his evil intent. All of these policies and systems, either sponsored or tolerated by the government and implemented by individuals were designed to destroy the very fabric of family life, opportunities for success, the creation of generational wealth, and even the mere existence of hope in communities of color. The harsh reality is that white supremacy has been an insidious cancer on our society and nation since its inception and it undermines the notions of a meritocracy and the land of opportunity that we hold so dear. However, white supremacy is not inevitable or unstoppable. It has been carefully cultivated and nurtured by individuals and the government for centuries. This is the history that we have all inherited it has been passed down from generation to generation. We must acknowledge that history. See that history for what it is. Recognize it. And learn from it, or we are doomed to repeat it. Let ours be the generation to put a stop to it. We can do better. We must do better. Our own humanity requires it. As an individual, we must call out injustice in our daily lives when we see it. We must reject racism in all of its forms. We must be conscious of the power of our words and actions and the impact they have on those around us, both intended and unintended. 
we must demand better of our public servants in their efforts to address inequity. And we must embrace government policies aimed at creating and fostering diversity, equity, and inclusion. We must make the outpouring of support, love, and compassion that followed this heinous act an everyday practice. We are stronger together. These are hard and challenging times. Our characters are being tested. The future of our nation is at stake. Are we up to the challenge? I believe that we are. In the words of Poet Laureate Amanda Gorman, there is always light. If only we are brave enough to see it. If only we are brave enough to be it. Mr. Gendron, please stand. There is no place for you or your ignorant, hateful, and evil ideologies in a civilized society. There can be no mercy for you, no understanding, no second chances. The damage you have caused is too great, and the people you have hurt are too valuable to this community. You will never see the light of day as a free man ever again. It is the judgment of this court for your conviction under the first count of the indictment, a domestic act of terrorism motivated by hate in the first degree, an A1 felony, that you be sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. Under the second count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of Roberta Drury, a vibrant 32-year-old young woman, a daughter, a dedicated sister, and friend, I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the third count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of 67-year-old Hayward Patterson, a son, father, and friend, known as a faithful, hardworking, generous, well-dressed man, I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the fourth count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of 77-year-old Pearl Young, a daughter, mother, grandmother, and friend, known for being a loving, dedicated substitute teacher. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the fifth count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of 86-year-old Ruth Whitfield, a daughter, sister, wife, mother, and grandmother, a dedicated caretaker, an avid fisherwoman, and a valued member of her church community. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the sixth count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of Celestine Cheney, a daughter, sister, mother, aunt, grandmother, and friend, a fighter who at 65 had beat cancer and multiple aneurysms, a person who enjoyed life and laughed easily. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the seventh count of the indictment, 
murder in the first degree, for the murder of Aaron Salter, age 55, a son, brother, husband, and father, a car guy, and a lover of camping, a retired Buffalo police officer, heroic and selfless to the very end. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the eighth count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of 53-year-old Andre McNeil, a son, brother, uncle, father, and fiance, devoted Miami Heat fan, survived by a three-year-old son. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the ninth count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of Margus Morrison, age 52, a son, brother, husband, and father. He loved music and sneakers. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the 10th count of the indictment, murder in the first degree, for the murder of 72-year-old Catherine Massey, Cat, a daughter, sister, aunt, and friend, an activist known for her sincerity, thoughtfulness, and honesty. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. Under the 11th count of the indictment, murder in the first degree for the murder of Geraldine Talley, age 62, a daughter, mother, and aunt, the life of the party, and a top-notch baker. I am imposing a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. By operation of law, the sentences on counts 2 through 11 must run concurrently with the sentence imposed on the first count. Under the remaining counts of the indictment to which you pled, the law permits me, based on your age, to consider granting you youthful offender status. The purpose of youthful offender status under the law is to prevent the stigmatization of young offenders based on hasty and thoughtless acts and to provide them a fresh start <clears throat> and a renewed opportunity to be a law-abiding productive member of society. However, given the manner in which you methodically planned, researched, conducted recognizance, and executed your hateful crimes. A finding of youthful offender status is not appropriate. There has, was nothing hasty or thoughtless about your conduct. There are no mitigating factors to be considered. You will be sentenced as an adult on the remaining counts. Under the 22nd count of the indictment, attempted murder in the first degree, for the attempted murder of 20-year-old Zaire Goodman, a beloved son, a hardworking young man of character, I am imposing the maximum determinant sentence of 25 years, followed by five years of post-release supervision. I direct this sentence to run consecutively to all other sentences imposed. Under the 23rd count of the indictment, attempted murder in the first degree, for the attempted murder of 55-year-old Christopher Braden, a son, father, husband, and friend, a professional serving the needs of the good people of the city of Buffalo, I am imposing the maximum determinant sentence of 25 years, followed by five years of post-release supervision. I direct this sentence to run consecutively to all other sentences imposed. 
under the 24th count of the indictment, attempted murder in the first degree for the attempted murder of Jennifer Warrington, age 50, daughter, mother, wife, friend, a professional serving the needs of the good people of the city of Buffalo. I am imposing the maximum determinant sentence of 25 years, followed by five years of post-release supervision. I direct the sentence to run consecutively to all other sentences imposed. Under the 25th count of the indictment, criminal possession of a weapon in the second degree, I am imposing the maximum determinant sentence of 15 years followed by five years of post-release supervision. I direct this sentence to run consecutively to all other sentences imposed. I am assessing the mandatory surcharge of $300, the crime victim assistance fee of $25, and a DNA fee of $50. You have 30 days to appeal the sentence of this court. This concludes these proceedings and the court will stand in recess. You heard, you heard the judge say there to Peyton Gendron right before she handed down her sentence that you will never see the light of day as a free man ever again and then sentenced him to life in prison without parole. That is Peyton Gendron, the 19 year old who drove to Buffalo to gun down as many black people as possible inside that top store on Jefferson Avenue on May 14th. 10 victims, three survivors, and a city shattered. Absolutely, and what we just heard from the judge was the sentence, uh, not unexpected. We had uh, life sentences for all of the murder counts and a mandatory 25 to li or 25 years, 25 years, and 25 years on attempted murder. So 90 years that will be served consecutively to the 10 life sentences without parole. Many emotional moments, yep. obviously, <clears throat> since the sentencing started around 945 this morning, hearing from many of the victim's family members who were emotional and many saying that they do not want him to be given the death penalty, which will be decided upon the federal court hearings. But uh, the most emotional moment and angry moment of the morning came when Catherine Massey, who's the sister of one of the victims, uh, Barbara Massey, or Barbara Massey rather is the sister of Catherine Massey, who's one of the victims. Barbara Massey was speaking, she was very, very angry. And at that point, someone lunged at Peyton Gendron. He was escorted out of the courtroom. A scuttle ensued, you see it all here. And the court was suspended for about 10 to 15 minutes as things got back under control. Um, but obviously raw emotion playing out there in the courtroom this morning as Peyton Gendron, the mass shooter at Tops, was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Yeah, we're going to bring in our legal expert, Paul Cambria, to get his reaction and, uh, and his analysis on what we just saw. Paul? Well, uh, I really wish that uh, everyone in the United States could view what we viewed today because it really was a teaching moment. I think, first of all, it demonstrated that our justice system works, that people are brought to justice, but not only that, others are able to have a voice, able to speak. And when we listen to all those individuals who did speak, I think that there was a tremendous message there as to how senseless this was and how a racial issue is an issue and has to be dealt with. And I think that, you know, all those comments just, you know, tugged at your heartstrings, but they made such an impact. Then the district attorney's office, their statements, I thought were uh, extremely appropriate along those same lines. And then at the end, the judge really tied it all together. And I think really uh, what we're going to see is this horrible event that happened in Buffalo may in fact uh, prove to be uh, an improvement in race relations because of the message that was so poignantly 
uh, delivered here today mm -hmm. during this whole process. Uh, I'm proud of our community as to the way it was handled, uh, but I really think a positive is going to come out of this. We can only hope so, Paul. The judge did speak about systemic racism and white supremacy and segregation in Buffalo upon sentencing Peyton Gendron today, and she said, mm -hmm. let ours be the generation to put a stop to it. We can do better. We must do better. So the judge did address all of those issues before sentencing him. Now, we did hear from Gendron himself today. This is the first time we've really ever heard him speak, and he did express remorse. He did apologize. He said, I did a terrible thing that day. I shot and killed people because they are black. I believe what I read online and acted out of hate. I don't want anyone to be inspired by me, by what I did. He said, looking back now, I can't believe that. I'm sorry for stealing the lives of your loved ones. Paul, I, I want to ask you what you think about his statement. Well, Some might say that they don't believe him. Some might say he's only being remorseful and apologizing because of what he's facing next in his federal trial. Yeah, well, there'll be people that say, you know, this is a version of foxhole religion, you know, that he's doing this because it's part of a strategy. He's looking at the bigger picture, which is the federal side where there could be a death penalty imposed and that, uh, you know, most people, I think, are going to say, you know, this was all staged and so none of this is remorseful, et cetera, uh, and that now he's just trying to save himself, save his own life uh, from his conduct. So I think it's going to be a hard sell. It was exactly what should be done by the defense attorneys. Um, they do, as I said before, they've hired a mitigation specialist. That's what they should do. The only play left for them is to try to convince the Attorney General of the United States not to seek the death penalty. Uh, so that was, you know, what they did was appropriate. <clears throat> Whether or not it's going to be believed uh, as sincere is uh, something that we'll, we'll see as time goes on. Paul, did you find it uh, a little transparent? Because Mr. Gendron made those statements pretty much emotionless. And that followed his defense attorney making the uh, the kind of laying the groundwork for the availability of weapons, systemic racism, generations of racism. Uh, did it read pretty transparent to you as, as this was a, a play to tomorrow? Well, I think that uh, that's going to be the interpretation. I think when you have something like this as heinous as this is and with so much preparation and then broadcasting, it's hard to think that a few months later, all of a sudden, there's all this great contrition. But as I say, that is exactly what the lawyers should be doing on his behalf to try to convince the attorney general not to seek the death penalty. Now, all those numbers that were thrown at the end with the uh, sentencing, what does that all mean? I mean, you have the life without parole, 10 counts of that, and then consecutively serving 25, three counts of 25 years uh, sentences. What does that all mean mathematically, just that he's going to be in prison for the rest of his life? Well, basically, um, it really had no impact once the first sentence was imposed on the terrorism charge of life without parole. It doesn't get any longer than that. And so to tack all these other sentences on really has no has, has no, they have no teeth because he's going to spend life in prison no matter what. And, but the sentences had to be pronounced. Uh, and, I mean, she said you have a right to appeal, and apparently that means that he did not waive his right to appeal, which I thought he had. Um, and, you know, that's why you have to impose a sentence on each and every crime so that all of those could be subject to attack. But frankly, there isn't anything to attack here, uh, and there's no real, char no real chance of any success on appeal. And one might say without teeth, but I, I think the importance was each and every victim was recognized in that sentencing. Mm -hmm. And we want to remember their names. Those 10 lives lost nine months ago on May 14th, Catherine Massey, Hayward Patterson, Celestine Cheney, Andre McNeil, Marcus Morrison, Pearl Young, Geraldine Talley, Roberta Drury, Ruth Whitfield, and Aaron Salter. 
those are the victims, those are the lives that were lost that will be remembered forever in our city. And we will have much more on today's sentencing coming out through the, throughout the day, including reaction from the courtroom, reaction from the families of the victims. That's all beginning at 4 o'clock. But we invite you to stay right here for more live coverage and analysis. Kelly Dudzik will be joining us for midday. Right, and behind the <clears throat> scenes right now, now that the sentencing is complete, we do know that we will hear from more of the victims' families and we will hear from some of the attorneys representing the victim's family. Again, there's a federal court case that will be happening. Patient Gendron is due in court tomorrow. There will also be civil cases. So while he has been sentenced to life in prison without parole and will spend the rest of his life behind bars, his time in the courtroom is far from over. So we'll be hearing from the families. We'll be hearing from the attorneys. We'll also be hearing from more legal analysis later today and bringing that to you throughout the day. Kelly Dudzik is up next with Channel 2 News Midday. With that, we are going to wrap up our special report. Thank you for joining us. Okay, it's still working. The battery's not. What? You gonna come to our city and decide you don't like black people. Man, you don't know a damn thing about black people. We're human. We like our kids to go to good schools. We love our kids. We never go in no neighborhoods and take people out. Don't do it. 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 High emotions as a man in the courtroom lunges at the shooter in the courtroom on live TV this morning. Today was the chance for families to address the top shooter face to face. And we wear red and black. Red for the blood that he shed for his family and for his community. And black because we are still grieving. You thought you broke us, but you awoke us. We all know the pure hatred and motivations behind your heinous crime, and we are here to tell you that you failed. The shooter faced more than a dozen charges at the state level. They include one count of a domestic act of terrorism motivated by hate, 
10 counts of first degree murder, three counts of attempted murder in the second degree, and one count of possession of a cr criminal possession of a weapon. He pleaded guilty to those charges last November. Today's sentencing in state Supreme Court comes nine months and one day since the mass shooting at Tops on May 14th. And this morning, we do want to take a moment to remember the 10 people who were shot and killed and lost their lives on that tragic day nine months ago. You will hear from many of their families this morning. Catherine Massey, Hayward Patterson, Celestine Cheney, Andre McNeil, Margus Morrison, Pearl Young, Geraldine Talley, Roberta Drury, Ruth Whitfield, and Aaron Salter. The judge addressed the courtroom for more than 10 minutes before handing down her sentence just moments ago. Is no place for you or your ignorant, hateful, and evil ideologies in a civilized society. There can be no mercy for you, no understanding, no second chances. The damage you have caused is too great, and the people you have hurt are too valuable to this community. You will never see the light of day as a free man ever again. It is the judgment of this court for your conviction under the first count of the indictment, a domestic act of terrorism motivated by hate in the first degree, an A1 felony, that you be sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. That again was Judge Susan Egan with the state sentencing this morning. We also heard from the shooter himself. All the pain I forced the victims and their families to suffer through. I'm very sorry for stealing the lives of your loved ones. I cannot express how much I regret all the decisions I made leading up to my actions on May 14th. I did a terrible thing that day. I shot and killed people because they were black. Looking back now, I can't believe I actually did it. I believed what I read online and acted out of hate. I know I can't take it back, but I wish I could. And I don't want anyone to be inspired by me and what I did. That was the killer right there, 19-year-old Peyton Gendron, sentenced to several life sentences this morning without parole. He is admitted to killing 10 people, injuring three others in a racially motivated mass shooting at Tops on Jefferson Avenue on May 14th. That was his address to the victim's families and one of the survivors in court today. Family members who lost a loved one and survivors shared their court testimony this morning. It was nine months ago yesterday that 10 people were murdered at the Jefferson Avenue Tops. Gendron pleaded guilty to murder and hate-related terrorism charges back in November, but this morning we heard from many of the victim's family members, including the son, the only child of Celestine Cheney. I watched you kill my mom. I watched you on the internet. I watched you shoot her once, reload, and shoot her again. I just want you to remember that name and what you did. You will never see the outside world again. I don't wish the death penalty on you. I wish they keep you alive. So you have to suffer with the thought of what you did for the rest of your life. The Erie County District Attorney's Office just started its press conference following the shooting. Let's listen in. Actually, that's defense survivor. attorney and their families was heart-wrenching. Their loss is unimaginable. For the devastation he caused, Peyton Gendron was sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison with no possibility of release. Our client committed these terrible crimes. He is responsible for his actions. He has been held accountable and will suffer the consequences for what he did. The case highlights a much deeper problem. This young man's violent, hate-fueled assault was in part the product of centuries of pervasive racism and discrimination in this country. These problems need to be addressed, as many others have publicly stated and demanded 
since this terrible event took place. Unfortunately, neither this proceeding nor any criminal trial can expose or address the historical racism that set the stage for our clients' horrible acts. We as a community need to have those conversations in our legislative bodies and our living rooms to achieve any sort of meaningful change. We know that some of the families and their lawyers have asked for the information collected by law enforcement during their investigations of this crime. We support that request. We hope that the resolution of this case brings the day for that information to be shared closer. The racist hate motivated this crime. It was spread through online platforms. And the violence was made possible by the access, easy access to assault weapons. Still, our client is responsible for committing this crime. He will spend the rest of his life locked away, and he will eventually die in state prison. We hope that knowing that he will never be free again will offer some small bit of comfort to those that he has hurt so much. Thank you. Just your names, Joe, if you could. Brian Parker. Robert Cutting. Dan Dubois. Thank you. Hearing from the defense team there after the sentencing, after the 19-year-old top shooter was sentenced to several life sentences without the possibility of parole this morning. We also heard from several of the victim's family members who spoke in court. One of the survivors who we had not heard from before who spoke about how he was shot in the leg. We also heard from one of the sisters, I believe, of one of the other people we had not heard from before, the pharmacist at the top shooting and the mother of one of the survivors as well, Zanetta Everhard, whose son Zaire was shot and is still recovering to this day. Um, we are going to hear from Heather Lee, who has been live at the courthouse all morning long. She has a sense of what's been happening there. But if you are just joining us, we've been on the air since about 930 this morning to bring you the sentencing of the top shooter live from the courthouse. Heather Lee is standing by. Heather. Hi there, Kelly. Good morning. It was an incredibly emotional morning. We heard from family members who lost a loved one. We also heard from survivors of that top shooting back on May 14th of last year. Powerful testimony in the courtroom this morning, and it was nine months ago yesterday that 10 people were murdered at that Jefferson Avenue tops. Peyton Gendron, the top shooter, pled guilty to murder and hate related terrorism charges back in November, and today he learned his fate. He was sentenced to consent executive life sentences for each person he killed and a life sentence for the domestic terrorism charge that he previously pled guilty to. Now again, we heard from so many family members, including the son, the only child of Celestine Cheney. I watched you kill my mom. I watched you on the internet. I watched you shoot her once, reload, and shoot her again. I just want you to remember that name and what you did. You will never see the outside world again. I don't wish the death penalty on you. I wish they keep you alive. So you have to suffer with the thought of what you did for the rest of your life. way out in terms of the death penalty. He says that he hopes to hear an apology from the shooter in the future. We also heard from a woman named Tamika, the niece of shooting victim Geraldine Talley and Christopher Braden, who was injured. So do I hate you? No. Do I want you to die? No. I want you to stay alive. I want you to think about this every day of your life. And she was taken away on my granddaughter's birthday. My granddaughter will never be able to celebrate her birthday on May 14th. It hurts so bad.
after the shooting was over, I saw all the victims where they lay. The visions haunt me in my sleep every night and most days. I cannot get those memories out of my head. And again, there were so many tears. There was yelling that raw emotion in the courtroom this morning. We have yet to hear from federal prosecutors on the federal case. Uh, the judge could potentially consider the death penalty there. That, of course, is something separate that is happening. What happened here in state Supreme Court today? Even the judge Kelly was emotional this morning. And finally, when she handed down that sentence, she looked right at the shooter and said that you will never walk the earth as a free man ever again. Reporting live outside of Erie County Court and State Supreme Court, I'm Heather Lee, Channel 2 News. Heather, thank you. The DA's office just started its press conference. Let's listen in. Do as a society and as a community going forward. And a lot of people have articulated and stated in various fashions and on various mediums of ideas that need to be in place to go forward. Where do we go as a community? Where do we go as a city? Where do we go in terms of the legal system and the criminal justice system and how it affects not only particular cases but society at large? And so these are questions that we need to answer, that us as leaders of the criminal justice system and the mayor and of all levels of government need to answer. What, what happened today, though, what happened throughout the prosecution of this case is still important. I would say that justice was done with a small J today, but we still have a big J of justice to do. But the small J for justice that occurred today was important. We should not minimize that. And in looking toward the future and in looking what we need to do, we still need to keep in light of what happened in the past six months. This prosecution and the resolution of this case is unprecedented. The mayor correctly stated it at the very beginning, on May 14th or May 15th, that swift justice is needed. And swift justice was done. Not only was it swift, it was just. It was just in the sense that he pled guilty to every charge. He pled guilty to for the first time in the history of New York State, the domestic terrorism charge motivated by hate. Never been done in the history of the state of New York. It was done here in Buffalo, New York. And today, he received the just sentence for the commission of that crime. And I know that one of the family members spoke about you know, I'm going to follow you for the rest of your life and whenever you're up for parole, et cetera, et cetera. There is no parole here. He is never getting out of jail. The federal prosecution is relevant, obviously, in, the, in terms of whether or not he is going to get the death penalty. But that's the only decision that really needs to be made in this entire process. He will spend, no matter what, the rest of his life behind bars. Never eligible for parole, never eligible for probation, never eligible for anything except viewing bars behind them for the rest of his life. Period. And that, I submit, is justice. You know, as, as a DA, I, you know, most of you all know me. There's some out of town reporters here. No, you don't know me, but I, I tend to stay in my lane. And, you know, my lane is obviously a narrow lane 
but it's important. It's important in the sense that a message needed to be sent that this individual was going to be held accountable for his actions. Now, I get it that whenever these mass shootings occur and tragedies like this happen nationwide, one just happened yesterday in Michigan State. The, the, the sides, whatever side you're on, tend to get out there. We need gun control. No, it's not gun control. We need people control. No, it's not people control. We need online control. As those of you who know me, I, I don't like sides. I like solutions. Everything needs to be on the table. Yes, we have a gun problem. Yes, we have a social media problem. But we also have a people problem. And that cannot be discounted. People need to be held accountable for their actions. People need to be taken off the streets and put away in prison to remove them from society. This defendant needed to be removed from society, taken off the streets, and put behind bars for the rest of his life. And he was. And that gives me some satisfaction. As I said before, obviously we got a lot of work to do. We need to make sure that from a DA's perspective, that anyone who commits a hate crime, anyone who incites act of violence based upon people's race, religion, creed, color, whatever it may be, be held accountable for their actions. And that is what I will do in my remaining time as DA. I know that the, a lot of the family members spoke today. I, um, you know, we all knew that today's sentence was a foregone conclusion, quite frankly, in the sense that when he pled guilty a few months ago, he was getting this sentence no matter what. But today gave the family members an opportunity to speak and to speak publicly and to speak to the system. And they did, and I thank them for that. I thank my assistant DA, Justin Caldwell, for speaking on behalf of my office and telling the judge what we exactly wanted, which is obviously what we wanted from the get-go by him pleading guilty to the charge of domestic terrorism, he will never get out of jail. And I thank Justin for that as well. Now, again, where we go forward from here is a question we all need to answer. Not just those in law, of us in law enforcement, but all of us in society. The immediate future obviously is continuing to help these families. And as the DA, I always try to keep the victims of crime first and foremost in my eyes and on my mind. And even though the case is over, from my perspective, we still need to help the victims. And I want to echo what the defense attorney, Mr. Parker, stated, where he stated on the record that he was willing to help the families in their pursuits of investigative materials to help them in their civil suits. And I want to echo that as well. I am here to help the families. There right now are two protective orders in place. There is a state protective order in place that precludes me from giving any of the information away to 
the victims or their attorneys. Now, that protective order on the state side does not automatically go away today by operation of law. That continues on until we change it. And so um, I will be making, um, in some form or fashion, uh, a motion to the court to get that protective order lifted or asking it be lifted. On the federal side, the, the problem is that I'm going to guess that 99.9% of all the investigative materials that I have, the feds also have. We have the same stuff. If there's five sheets of paper that are different, I'd be shocked. And so the problem is going to be that while that federal case is pending, it's going to be difficult for the feds to release that documentation to the families. And so, like I mentioned, there is a federal order, protective order in place that has my name on it. Now, I was never a party to that at all. I never consented to that at all. But somehow, um, the Erie County DA's office name got put on that protective order. So I will be also, in some, fa uh, some fashion, making a motion to the federal court to get my name removed from that. And I am hopeful that we can work out an agreement that's somehow judicially supervised where the materials can be turned over to the civil attorneys so they can review it and prepare their lawsuits and then a protective order put on them where they can't disclose to the public. There's things like that that can be done. And so I am hopeful that that can occur. Um, obviously, this would all be a moot point if the federal case gets resolved sooner rather than later. But again, I'm not going to step on their toes at all. Uh, I will not be commenting at all about whether or not I think the death penalty should be in place or not be in place or anything about the federal case at all. Um, I'll, I'll stay in my lane, and I'm not going to step on their toes or get, get into that at all. Uh, but uh, I am going to get into continuing to help the families and doing everything I can to help them further along. So uh, with that being said, um, let me just uh, end here with my heartfelt thanks and gratitude. Uh, obviously, none of this would have taken place today without the city of Buffalo. And the city of Buffalo uh, includes the mayor's office, and the Buffalo Police Department. And obviously, it was the heroic members of the Buffalo Police Department uh, that arrived on the scene. You talk about swiftness. Uh, the swiftness of justice pales in comparison to the swiftness of the Buffalo Police Department in responding to that 911 call and getting the tops within minutes. And so, uh, I cannot thank the Buffalo Police Department uh, the commissioner uh, and the mayor of the great city of Buffalo, Byron Brown, for all his, of his work and all of their work uh, in bringing this case to fruition. Mayor, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DA. Well, I want to start out with thanks and gratitude. I want to thank District Attorney John Flynn and his assistric, assistant district attorneys for doing a tremendous job in prosecuting uh, this horrific case and helping the wheels of justice uh, turn very swiftly in this instance. I want to thank uh, Police Commissioner Grimalia and the members of the Buffalo Police Department uh, for responding so swiftly to this crime uh, and preventing further loss of life. If not for the very quick response of the Buffalo Police Department, it was the intent of this individual to kill more black people, to take more black lives, and the Buffalo Police Department prevented that. Uh, this clearly was an act of domestic terrorism motivated by hate. And clearly, this individual was guilty. Uh, we all saw it. The individual 
broadcast it. They put it on social media. Uh, as District Attorney Flynn said, uh, he pled guilty. There was never any doubt of what the outcome of this sentencing was going to be today. Uh, Police Commissioner Grimalia and I uh, were in the sentencing today. We wanted to support uh, the members of our community, the families of the victims, uh, the 10 precious people who were killed, uh, the three others that were wounded. Uh, we wanted to be there to support them, and we wanted to be there to have eyes on this defendant uh, to demonstrate the strong desire in this community to see justice done. The statements of the family members that spoke were incredibly powerful. Uh, if you had any human feeling whatsoever, it was hard to hold it together in that courtroom and not have the tears flow and the emotion flow. Uh, the family members in powerful detail shared with us the depth of their loss, the magnitude of what was taken from them. Their courage, their ability to speak under these circumstances is just amazing to me. I, I see the family members and how they have stood up through this, how they have stayed together through this and fought for justice for their family members as nothing short of heroic as well. I can tell you, uh, and the DA alluded to it, uh, certainly what we heard today, uh, the comments of the defense attorney, uh, the comments of Judge Susan Egan in rendering her decision, what happened in this community certainly uh, cries out for sensible gun reform, uh, why the city of Buffalo has brought a lawsuit against ghost gun manufacturers and members of the uh, gun industry. Uh, it cries out for uh, mental health uh, treatment and resources. Thank you to Governor Hochul uh, for putting resources in the proposed state budget for more mental health resources in the state of New York. Uh, this cries out for reigning in social media. The defense attorney said that this individual uh, was definitely impacted, radicalized by social media. We have to rein that in. We cannot allow hate speech to proliferate on social media. And finally, white supremacy. It is a cancer, uh, it is a horror, uh, and it is capable of motivating people to commit these kinds of crimes in our community. More has to be done to stamp out uh, white supremacy and its proliferation. This mass shooting in Buffalo, we had hoped and prayed that this would be the last one we saw um, when it occurred May 14th, uh, 2022. Sadly, uh, last year there were hundreds more after Buffalo. This year, already 67 mass shootings in the United States of America. So the DA is, is right. Uh, this is the end of the beginning. There's a lot more work to be done, not just in this community, uh, but all across America. And so I am thankful, again, for the work of District Attorney Flynn uh, and his office. Uh, I continue, and all of us continue, to pray for the strength of the families of the victims, uh, that God will hold them up. Uh, and continue to give them strength as they go through this trauma. 
Uh, and finally, I will say, uh, while these families have been traumatized, our entire community has been traumatized by this, as Judge Egan indicated. Uh, it will take some time uh, for all of us to get through the trauma uh, that we experienced on 514. But we are a strong community. We are a resilient community. We are a community that stands together in times of difficulty, and we will in this time as well. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> he will be transferred probably to tomorrow to federal custody, and then that prosecution will go forward. Um, again, like I said, I, I don't have any control over that at all. Um, you know, we don't we don't talk about that at all. At all. And so they will um, <clears throat> they they will then continue the prosecution of their case. But he will be transferred uh, probably by tomorrow uh, into federal custody. Potential repercussions with what happened in the courtroom today at all, or was that just handled? No, there's no repercussions. Um, I told the uh, OCA officers um, not to charge him, so he will not be charged. Th this has um, this has happened before. Um, you know that I, I don't know if if the office of court administration has a budget line or not for you know, damaged property. Um, but, um, you know, people have punched holes in walls before, um, and, you know, we can, we can fix it. And so, you know, obviously uh, I am, um, you know, emotions are high. This is, a, this is a tragic incident that occurred in our city. Um, I'm not going to compound that tragedy by charging someone with criminal mischief. Um, now, again, let, let me be clear, though. I don't want this can't happen, you know, every day. Obviously, don't, don't, don't let my mercy here on one individual um, allow others tomorrow or the next day to, you know, attack people in the courtroom or damage courtroom property. Because, you know, at some point, um, I'm gonna get, I, I will charge you. All right. So don't, don't let that, um, don't let today serve as an indicator of my future decisions. We are going to send you back to regular programming in just a minute, but this press conference uh, is streaming right now on WGRZ.com. There's also another press conference that will begin shortly with some of the family members of the victims and their attorneys. We'll be streaming that for you on WGRZ.com. It'll also be on our app. But you just heard from the district attorney, John Flynn, and also Buffalo Mayor Byron Brown about the top sen uh, shooter sentenced today to life in prison without the possibility of parole, which was expected. We also heard from several of the victims, family members this morning, and one of the survivors of the shooting as well. But again, that press conference with the district attorney is continuing right now on our website. There's also another press conference scheduled for sometime this afternoon with several of the victims, family members and their attorneys. We will be carrying that live for you on WGRZ.com and on our two on your side app. Our team coverage of today's sentencing will continue here on Channel 2 at 4 o'clock with Most Buffalo. Potentially. And what about family members who told us some of them have said that they want him to spend the rest of his life in prison others have said they want him yeah. again you know as a <clears throat> as a prosecutor um again I, I can't speak for the feds obviously but you know I, I can tell you what I do you know as a prosecutor I always um you know listen to the victims uh, of crimes and, and get their input uh but at the end of the day it is the prosecutor's decision uh on whether or not to um, take a plea, do something at trial, or recommend a sentencing. And so um, at the end of the day, that will be the, the federal prosecutor's decision. Um, but, you know, again, I suspect, like I do, they will take input from the family members. Do you think there's a very good chance he will face the death penalty on the federal level? I'm not going to comment on that. I, I have no idea. I have no idea what, um, what mechanisms, uh, mechanisms are in place for that. Well, I mean, I... You know, I know the decision-making authority is not going to happen here in Buffalo. 
it'll happen in Washington, D.C. at the Department of Justice main, main building. Um, you know, they will make that call. Uh, but I have, like I said, I have no input on that at all, and I have no, no knowledge of what is going through their minds right now at all, so I really can't comment. Yeah, we, we had planning. I mean, we have, uh, you can see there's a police presence outside and, and there's things that you don't see, but, uh, you know, you're definitely right on the emotion part. It was a tough day. Um, you know, this is a, this has been tough since uh, May 14th at 2.28 in the afternoon. Um, you know, you, you'd think that today uh, brings some kind of resolution and it, and it really doesn't. Uh, it was a very hard day and, and I commend the family members uh, who were able to actually go up there and, and, and face him and, um, you know, say what they had to say and not to take anything away from the family members that didn't. Uh, they're going through so much. They will be going through so much for a long time, but um, it's, it's a lot on, on the community. It's a lot, of course, on the family. It's a lot on our officers. It's, it's been a lot that everyone's gone through. You know, as, as has been said, it was a tough day. Uh, it was a very emotional day. Uh, as mayor, as a member of the community, sitting there, listening to the statements of the family members, it was very painful. Uh, several times I, I felt like I was going to have to reach for a tissue. It was so painful. Emotions were running incredibly high. I can understand. Uh, people wanting to rush the defendant. Not the right thing to do. Uh, didn't want to see it happen, but can understand it uh, because this is such a painful thing. This is such a gut-wrenching thing uh, that happened to members of our community and happened uh, to the members of the family of the people who were in the courtroom today. So I understand the emotion that people were feeling. Yeah, no, no, nothing more has been articulated already. Um, I mean, again, uh, obviously this was um, uh, all videotaped. <clears throat> you know, the, uh, he, he was live streaming it as it was going along. Uh, you know, we had uh, obviously the, uh, the lightings that, that he, that he uh, produced. Um, you know, there were two sets of, of documents, for lack of a better word. Um, you know, the manifesto has gotten a lot of play, but there was also a second document um, that, that he generated as well that was more kind of a compilation of materials than actually, you know, written by him. Uh, that again, you know, showed his motivation of hate uh, and his, uh, uh, his reasoning, warped it as it may be, of, of why he wanted to do this. Uh, and you know, we you know, you don't need a motive, obviously, in a in a, in a murder prosecution. You want to have one, uh, and we had a motive here uh, all along. Uh, we had um, we had live stream witness testimony. We had the ballistics. Um, we had the weapon. Uh, you know, we had pretty much a slam dunk case from the moment this ended. Uh, and again, yeah, there's no real new evidence that, that came about. As far as the family members are concerned, <clears throat> I know that, uh, you know, during the guilty plea that occurred a couple months ago, one of the family members made a comment that, you know, she heard something uh, on that day for the first time. Uh, you know, we, you know, d during the course of a prosecution, you need to hold some things close to your vest as far as what your evidence is, and so because you know you don't want it out there. Um, you know, again, I, I 
I apologize to that family member, you know, who, who might have heard something for the first time that was upsetting to them. Uh, and, I, you know, the reason for it was not to hide anything from the family at all. It was basically to just, you know, prepare for trial in the event we had to go to court uh, and not having that evidence out there that could be used by the other side against us or against justice. So by, by holding things back and by keeping our evidence, you know, um, somewhat tight to the vest, we're doing that for the family's sake. We're doing that to help the families because we want a guilty verdict. Well, he'll, he'll, go, he'll go to federal de detention to be held there while the uh, prosecution of the federal case will occur. And any indication of how long that might No, I, don't, I have no idea. No. Now, no. I, I, I really don't know, sir. I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not in the federal courthouse. I'm not in the building. I, I'm not talking to them at all about, you know, what, what, they're, what they're doing, so I really don't know. Um, now, after it's over, um, so he'll be transferred to the federal facility now for pretrial confinement um, for federal purposes, all right? When the federal proceeding is over, then a decision will be made, will he go, let, let, let's assume they don't go to death penalty, all right? He goes to jail. Uh, a decision will be made, will he go to state prison for the rest of his life or to federal prison for the rest of his life? And and, um, well, no, 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 because the state judge ordered him to do that. We'll, we'll talk amongst ourselves then on, on what we feel is the best, uh, you know, path forward. Um, it'll probably be, be a federal pr uh, uh, center uh, because they have, um, they have more resources in the federal detention centers to, to house him in an appropriate environment. Oh yes, <clears throat> family families have been great. Uh, you know, the, the families were obviously uh, upset that he came into the guilty plea with a hair with a haircut. Um, you know, looking like a little boy. You know, they the families you know felt that that was a distortion. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. His family. Um, his family was not contacted by, by me at all. Um, his family, um, I, I never spoke to his family at all. Um, uh, you know, his family was cooperative with, with, you know, with, with the investigation, from my understanding, but I never had any contact with them at all. Um, and I thought, I have no idea what they're, what they're feeling at all. Did that say anything to you? Did they did not discuss it? Did no, because again, we, 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 we typically don't talk to the defendant's family members um, in the sense, you know, during the proceedings. You know, we, you know, they're talked to up front by investigators um, as far as a gathering of evidence and whether or not they had any, anything to share as far as evidence is concerned. But once that initial interview process takes place, the defendant's family is never really on our radar to talk to at all because, again, you know, they're, they're on the other side. He's represented by an attorney, um, and we do all communications through their attorney. To the best of your knowledge, were they at any of these proceedings? Um, no, no, they were not. They were not at any proceedings I'm aware of, and they were they were not there today. Uh, Claudine, yeah, Claudine. Yeah. I can say with 100% certainty, as I stand here now at 12, um, uh, 38 uh, on February 15, 2023, um, he acted alone. Now again, if if ev well, uh, everything can change. I mean, you know, you get more evidence in the future, some pops up, some witness comes forward and says, "Hey, oh yeah, by the way, I talked to it the week before." Um, I highly doubt that, because um, uh, again, we've pretty much dotted all our eyes and crossed all our T's, but. Is it possible, Claudine? Absolutely, anything's possible. But as I stand here right now, uh, I have no evidence at all that tells me he had any help. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.